Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We are here on Saturday with God's Church of Love Online reading Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth, Nazareth, unto Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the household and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I'm stopping there because I want to ask you a question. Is there any room for him in your inn? in the place you live, in your dwelling, in everything that pertains to you? Is there room in your inn? Or as in the day they had Jesus stuck in a manger because they were in a barn, basically. Where is Jesus in your life? Is he in your back drawer? Is he on the back burner? Is he in the basement? Is he in your storage cabinet? Do you pull him out when it's time for some meds? Do you pull him out when it's time for a drink? Do you pull him out when you have a problem? That's what I want to ask you. Where do you keep Jesus in your life? Where is he compartmentalized with the rest of your things? Or is he, does he have free range? Does he, does he have control over your life? Or are you still trying to keep control? Are you still trying to run the show and supervise everything that goes on? Now, the reason I ask that is because there are times when we go through things in our lives, when we call on Jesus when there's a crisis, crisis, Jesus, I need you now. Or there's an emergency. Uh -uh. Lord, Lord, come now. I need you. But the rest of the week or the rest of the month, we haven't had time. We don't want to be bothered with the things of God. Because if somebody makes me upset, I want to say what I want to say. I don't want him cramping out, cramping my style. Because I know how to tell people off. I know how to get them told. I know how to put people in their place. So, you know, it's nice that Jesus has his place, but stay in your lane, Jesus. You stay there, I'll stay here. I'll call you. Don't call me. I'll call you. And sometimes we treat him that way. Uh, Ding-a-ling-a-ling, bellhop. Would you please bring me this? And would you please bring me that on the table? Thank you very much before you leave. I'll give you a tip later. Put it on the tab. We don't understand that that's really how many of us treat God. How many of us treat our Savior, our Lord and our Savior. And he ends up being diminished from Lord to bellhop. From Lord to good luck charm. And we hang him around our neck. Or we wear them in our earlobe. Or we'll stick them on our dashboard. Advertise for them a little bit. But we are not allowing him to take full control over our lives. To take full control over us. We're not allowing that, are we? See, that's where we have to be careful. Because God said, my spirit will not always strive with you. So even though we believe in Jesus and we think that gets us in, that puts us on the in crowd, on the inner sanctum, guess what? God's word says the devils believe too and tremble. 
But that doesn't make them saved because they believe. Think about it. Think about it. Believing is not just quoting. Believing is not just acknowledging. Believing is not just giving it our assent. We acquiesce with the word. Oh, yes, it's true. But what are you living? What are you living? What are you doing to prove to the world that it's all about Jesus for you? Hmm. Yes. They didn't have room in the end. Here, Mary is great with child and traveling miles. Can you imagine how painful that had to have been for her? Traveling all that time, how uncomfortable that was with her belly way out ready to deliver any minute. And they couldn't find any accommodation for her. So they find a barn. That's the best they could do. And she has to give birth over some hay. And Jesus is laid in a manger, in a feeding trough. Because nobody else had room for him. When are we going to make room for Jesus, you guys? He went through a lot. Not only did his mother go through a lot to give birth, he went through a lot to get us off the hot seat, to, to pay our debt. He, he, he went through a lot to receive the penalty that should have been ours. He received the penalty of death so that we could have the, the benefit of the life of God dwelling in us, the abundant life. Love, joy, peace, satisfaction, fulfillment, purpose. That's why he did that. So we could receive healing. So we could receive wholeness. So we could, we could, life could make sense in our lives. We could make sense. But see what happens is when things are going fine, we like to compartmentalize. There's a time for this. There's a time and a place for our job. There's a time and place for our friends. There's a time and place for our social life, for the party life, whatever we do. There's a time and a place for those few moments when we want to be bothered visiting our parents, if at all. When we want to Spend time with our children, if at all. And we want to compartmentalize the Lord. So my question to you is, do you have room for Jesus in your inn? Is he in or is he out? Have you put limits on him? Have you uh, drawn a, a line in the sand and said, don't cross over because you're not welcome over here. This is my turf. It's my, it's my domain. You stay over there. And when I need you, I'll call you. But see, you have to forget, Jesus is not your hireling. Jesus is not getting paid a salary by you. Jesus paid it all for you and me, which gives him full right. Jesus created you and me, which gives him full right. However, he is a gentleman and he will not tread where he is not welcome. Have you welcomed him in? Have you chosen to relinquish your rights for the sake of him taking over everything that pertains to you for the sake of him having the right to come in and clean up your act clean up your filth clean up your attitude clean up your mouth clean, uh, ooh, clean up your behavior we have to be willing to relinquish 
We want to always be in control. We always want to head up everything and make all the decisions in our lives. Some decisions you have to pull back and say, okay, Lord, that's what I want to do. But if that's not your will, I won't. I feel like I have a right. I deserve the right to be able to do that. But if you don't want me to do it, I won't. I may not like your decision, but I want you to be in control because you know what's best for me. Is that the case for you? Or have you stuck him off in your little feeding trough somewhere and shoved it under the bed only to pull it out when you really need him? Some of us have friendships like that. Some of us have family members like that. Some of you, your family never hears from you till you need them. Your family doesn't get a conversation with you unless you're on the phone asking for money. And that's the same way many of you treat God. Jesus, help me. I need to pay my rent. And if that rent doesn't come, you're mad at him, not you. Some of y'all going to go broke during the Christmas holidays like we were talking about earlier. And then you'd be mad at God for not providing. You overspent and you expect him to pull all the tricks out of the genie to come to your rescue. When you don't have the time, you don't give him your, your talents, you don't give him your energy, you don't talk to him, you don't consult with him, you don't ask him anything, you don't listen, you don't do anything, you don't read his word, you don't have time. It's a, you know how we say, it's a need to know basis and you don't need to know. Well, there are times when Jesus is treated like it's a when I need you basis and I don't need you right now. Thank you. Let's ask God to give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, one thing I noticed about Jesus, when you look in the New Testament, you look at Mary Magdalene when the, the tomb was empty and Jesus had risen from the grave. You remember how she went down and she kept stooping and looking and she's wondering where her Savior was. What did they do with his body? Because in her mind, he's dead, right? Because she saw him die. What did they do with his body? Oh, my, my. Well, she hungered and thirsted for her Savior. Not for what he could do for her. For her Savior. She hungered for him. And guess what Jesus did? Because Jesus responds to hunger, he showed up. He didn't open her eyes. He showed up. And she thought he was the gardener. And she says, where, where is my Lord? They have taken him. Where have they taken him? Please tell me. And he turned around and he called her name, Mary. Then her eyes were opened supernaturally and she recognized her Lord and Savior. So obviously he didn't look the way he did when he came off that cross. Mm -hmm. Think about it. But the thing is, she hungered and thirsted for him. The men on Emmaus Road, they're walking down the road talking about everything that happened that weekend. The crucifixion, the whole nine yards. And what happens? Jesus shows up in their midst. And because he didn't open their eyes supernaturally, they just thought him to be a traveling stranger. So they're talking about the events that went on. And their souls were stirred within them in his presence till he opened their eyes. Because when they asked him to keep going with them and he broke the bread and he poured the wine, their eyes were immediately opened and they recognized their risen Lord and Savior, risen from the dead. Now, you know why Jesus showed up? That's God gave me that revelation. When Mary Magdalene was stooping down, looking in the tomb, when the men were walking down Emmaus Road, rehearsing what happened, the hunger, the longing in their souls for him, 
made him show up. Some of you will never experience God because you don't hunger for him. You don't long for him. You don't love him. You don't, you don't appreciate him. You don't. You, oh. Calm down, calm down, calm down. God responds to hunger. You cannot have a part-time, good-time Charlie and expect a full-time experience. You cannot have a part-time lover in your Lord and Savior and expect a full-blown experience, a full-blown encounter because he will not come to a casual acquaintance. You want God. You want Jesus. You want to experience him. Take him out of the trough. Take him out of your basement. Take him out of your back drawer. Take him off the back burner. Stop treating him like a bellhop. Psalms 91 says, Psalms 91 says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You have to, you have to dwell there. You have to dwell in him, eat him, drink him, think him, love him. Everything or everything that motivates you is all about him. What pleases him? What do you want from me, Lord? What do you want me to be? Help me to be all that you want me to be. You see flesh in you. You get it out the way because you want to please him. Because you're hungering and thirsting after him. Do you hunger and thirst for him? Or is he just your part-time lover? Is he your sidekick? Oh, come on, you guys. Make room for him in your inn. Make room. If you never make room for him, you'll never encounter him. Think about that. When you go through this Christmas holiday and you think about Jesus laying in a feeding trough because nobody had room for him. Make room, you guys. These are the last days. You better make room soon. You need to know him, not believe in him like the demons do. The demons believe in him. They know about him. They tremble, but they're not saved. So believing is not all it takes to be saved. Believing is not all it takes to experience him one-on-one, -on -one, to consummate with him in the spirit realm, to have him come into your heart and you dwell in his heart and the two of you are one. You're blanketed in Jesus. You're blanketed in his love. You're sustained by his power. You're, <clears throat> you're moved by his mercy, his tenderness, his compassion, his understanding of you because he's all the way in. He's in your in. Ah! He's, he dwells in the innermost parts of you. That's the way you want it. That's when it becomes real. That's when it changes from religion to relationship. Mm, okay. <laughs> God bless you this Christmas holiday. And rethink that question. Will you ever have room for him in your inn? Or will he always be on the outskirts? God bless you as you ponder that. Amen.